Hello everyone, welcome to the 43rd webinar of the Rus Copernicus project. My name is Georgia Karadimu, and in this webinar we will learn how to monitor changes at the shorelines due to coastal erosion using Sentinel-1 data. This time we will visit Africa and more specifically we will check what are the erosion conditions at the coast of Senegal. Coastal erosion has been a major problem for many areas around the world and the coasts are economically important for many countries as a large part of the gross domestic product is derived from coastal activities and they are being eroded too fast. About 40% of the world's population live near coasts. Coastal erosion, whether it is caused by natural or human activities, it has important effects on the populations who can no longer live close to the coastline and to the infrastructure. Monitoring of coastal environments and the tracking of their evolution provide fundamental information to policy and decision makers on local, regional and national levels. More specifically, along the northwest coast of Africa, average rates of coastal retreat between 1 and 2 meters per year have been measured. Okay, let's start by having a look at the structure of this webinar. We will first have a quick introduction about the Rus service, what the project is about, followed by some updates. We will talk a bit about Sentinel-1 satellite and its data. We will continue with a short introduction about the study area and some theory about the coastal erosion. And then we will move to the exercise in the Rus virtual machine. Finally, a Q&A session will follow at the end. The webinar will last around one to one and a half hour, including both the demonstration part and the Q&A session. And please be aware that this webinar is being recorded and you will be able to repeat the exercise by yourself later, once it will be uploaded in our YouTube channel and our training website. In the meantime, you can start sending us your questions as soon as you have one, and with my colleagues here, we will answer to as many of them as possible. The rest of them, and those of high interest for everyone, we will discuss them live at the Q&A session. In any case, all of your questions will be answered after the webinar is completed in the relative document that we will upload at our training website together with this recording. Okay, let's talk a bit about the RUS service. RUS stands for Research and User Support for Sentinel Core Products. It is an initiative funded by the European Commission and managed by the European Space Agency with the objective to promote the uptake of Copernicus Sentinel data and support research and development activities. The service provides a free and open scalable platform in a powerful computing environment hosting a suite of open source toolboxes pre-installed on virtual machines which allow you to handle and process the data derived from the Sentinel satellites. In addition to all that, RUS also provides a specialized user help desk support to support your remote sensing activities with Sentinel data and a dedicated training program. Let's talk now a bit more in detail about the training program and the updates of this project. We are offering our services in two main categories based on whether a RUS virtual machine is available to users or not. The first category includes the RUS training activities, and the second includes requests coming from individual users and people working on R&D projects. Regarding the training activities, the RUS virtual machines will be provided to the users like this. For the face-to-face -face trainings and the virtual classroom events, we can accommodate around 20 participants, providing a virtual machine to each one. The type of the virtual machine depends on the training category and the ICT team will support you during and after the session for any technical issues you may have. After the event and in case you need to further use the virtual machine, you can extend uh, its total duration maximum up to one month. Every month we are offering our webinars and the PDF tutorials will continue to be available to everyone via the RUS portal. For those who will receive a virtual machine for replaying a webinar, the VM availability will not exceed in duration the two weeks. For the external trainings requested, 30 VMs maximum will be provided per event 
and the participants will benefit from the remote support of our ICT team. And now moving to the individual users that want to perform any project, the standard uh, Roost virtual machines provided until recently will not be available anymore, but instead the solution of the Docker container image will be offered. It will contain the Roost virtual environment and our ICT team will provide the necessary support for us accessing the Docker and installing the selected Roost tools on your own infrastructure. You can find more information about the Docker at the link provided here on the right. Here you can see the Roost websites where you can find all the information about the project in our Roost portal here on the left. So I recommend you to check it after the webinar to get familiar with the service and learn more about the updates of the project. So register by creating an account and if you're eligible, request the service. On the right part of the slide, you can see and visit our training page where you can find the announcements for our upcoming webinars and events, the recorded videos with the Q&A documents of the webinars delivered so far, and our e-learning material. There, by simply creating an account, you can access the material on various topics and practice at your own pace. Every time you repeat a course, a different set of questions appear and you have the chance to learn more. At the end, if you successfully complete the quizzes, you will receive a certificate of completion. In case you face any difficulty while signing up, please contact us. As I mentioned in the beginning, we also have our YouTube channel, the Rus Copernicus Training, where you can find all the videos of our previous webinars and you will also find this one in a couple of days. Now let's see some information about the Sentinel-1 data we will use. In this exercise, we will be using SAR data provided by the Sentinel-1A satellite. The Sentinel satellites are included in the space component of the Copernicus program of the European Commission and the European Space Agency. The Sentinel-1 mission is formed by a constellation of two twin satellites faced at 180 degrees to each other. It is an active sensor working on C-band it includes a right-looking active phased area antenna, providing fast scanning in elevation and azimuth, and it provides data with a short repeat cycle of six days and with different imaging modes. Here you can see the four different acquisition modes, of which we will use the IW, and the four products of each mode, of which we will use GRD, the ground rage detected data. We will now talk a bit about what causes coastal erosion. First of all, the waves. We have two types of waves, the destructive and the constructive. On the left, you can see how the destructive waves work. They basically have weak swaths and strong backwash. And the strong backwash removes sediment from the beach. These type of waves are steep and close together. On the right, we have the constructive waves. The characteristics of these waves are strong swaths and weak backwash. With the strong wash to bring sediments and build up the beach. The backwash is not so strong to remove the sediment, so the waves are also low and further apart. In this slide, you can see some examples of various areas around the world as they are presented by Jugendic et al. 2018, and the two areas on the left suffer from erosion, while the other two areas on the right, we have the position conditions. Also, according to a JRC article published in Nature's Scientific Reports, it is stated that there is an increasing trend of erosion along the world's coastlines with twice as much land lost than what was replaced over the last 30 years. It is estimated that this covers a surface area of about 28,000 square kilometers. So, as we mentioned in the beginning, we will visit Senegal in Africa and we will check how the coastline has been changing in the last six years 
using Sentinel-1 data from 2015 until 2021. Senegal is exposed to the Atlantic Ocean at its western part, so we will check how these coasts in different locations of the country are being affected. We will move from northern coasts towards southern, and in order to be as consistent as possible to the weather conditions over the area, we use data taken on July of each year. Okay, now let's move to the Rose Virtual Machine in order to start our exercise. So, this is the Rose Desktop, and here we insert our credentials and we log in. And this is how it looks like. We have here our software that we need to use. And before we start processing the data, what is important is to download the data. So what we're going to do is we're going to go here in the Firefox and we visit the Copernicus Open Access Hub where we will search the data we want to download. We click here and we go here on the top right and we log in with our account. If we don't have an account, first we sign up. So here we have the account already, so log in. And then we just navigate over Senegal and we plan to focus in this area that is exactly over here. So this part, I just select the drawing tool. I draw the area that is of interest for me. And then I go here on the left and I want to search the data available for Sentinel-1 for each year for the period of July, but we will do it separately. We will do it year by year. For example, let's set the parameters. In the sensing period, we go and we select a range, for example, 1st of July 2021 to, let's say, um, 15th of July 2021. Then we select the mission Sentinel-1 and from this mission we want the product type to be the GRD and the sensor mode to be the IW as we said before. And then we click search. We see that this is the result of the search we run and in order to download this product we just click here on this icon that says download product and it starts automatically to download. This product belongs on the 9th July 2021. Once we have this, we can go back to the search and go and do the same for the other product that we want of 2020. We set again the same period, 1st of July 2020, to 15th of July 2020. And we wait to see, based on this, parameters we inserted, what the search will return to us. Okay, now it returns two products. What we would like to do is to try to keep the data that belong to more or less on the same time period. So you can choose either image, but I would suggest to take the image on 14th July 2020. What do we see now? We see that these products are offline. For those of you who are not aware what this is, this means that any data that are older than one year by the today's day or data that are not very usually used, they go to the long-term archive, they become offline so that it, they don't occupy a space. And what you can do to uh, make it online is to click here on the download product and once you click on that, you get this message saying that the offline product retrieval initiated and what you need to do is follow these instructions and go and check after a while in your cart if the products are on online or not. How do you find your cart? You go here to your account and you click cart and you will find it in there. Note that you don't receive any notification when this becomes online so you just need to go after a few minutes and check if it has become online. 
So we do exactly the same for the other products that belong to 2019, 2018, 2017, 2016, and 2015. We cannot go back for Sentinel-1 uh, further back than that because there are no data available. I will not do it now for all the products, but in the tutorial I have the list of the products and if you want, what else you can do is you can just go straight up here on the insert search criteria and you can copy and paste here the name of the product and then search it by the name. Okay, let me now close this because we do not need that. I have the data downloaded so that we start processing the data in SNAP. Before we open SNAP, I would like to show you the data we downloaded that we have copied them in the folder that we wish to use. So if you open here the shared and you go on the training, cost 02, coastal erosion, you will find in there three folders one with some auxiliary data, one that has the original data, and the one that we will store all the data we will process. If I open now the original one, you see here that these are the seven images we have for our case study. Now I can open SNAP so that I load these products and we start working. Okay, let's close this message window. And we go here in the original folder and we take them one by one from the oldest to the most recent. We just drag it here on the left on the Product Explorer window and we drop it in there and it appears here. Let me load all the other products as well. And then we will see each one of them where exactly they are located on Earth. They should all be over the same area. So, we're here, if we go here on the world view and we zoom in, we can see that all our products are covering the area that is of interest for us, which is here in Senegal. So, if we go here and we expand this one, and we also expand the BANS folder, we will open the Intensity V8s. We double click on that and we create the image. Now, note that this product, it has intensity and amplitude bands for both polarizations, the V8 and the VV. From literature, we found out that it's better for such cases to use the V8 polarization. So I proceed like that and I open all the intensity V8 bands of all the products so that we see exactly where they are located because as you understood, we're not going to use the whole area. This is not necessary. So we need to see exactly how they look like so that we cut, we subset only the area that is of interest for us. Now we have all intensity bands opened. And the next thing we can do is we can go up here on this window tile horizontally and then we can go down here on the navigation and select this option that says zoom all so we basically have the full picture of the area what can we see here we see that these five images the last five recent ones belong uh, to the same area and cover the exact same extent while these two others, they are a bit different from 2015 and 2016. But which, which is the area that we want to focus on? Let me go in this one so that we have a more clear picture. The area we want belongs over here. On this small area. In order to make it a bit easier, I will just close a few windows so that we have some more space. Okay, I think now we are okay. So, as I said, in this area, what we want to do is we want 
to zoom in a bit more. And we want to create a subset. We do not need the whole image. How do we create a subset? There are several ways. Let me show you this one. You go up here that says Rectangle Drawing Tool. You select it and you go over the area you want to subset and you just draw a rectangle. Once you draw it, you go up here and you select the Selection Tool. Then you click on this area that you just drew and you right click on that and you select well-known text from geometry. Here you have this polygon that has the geographic coordinates of these images. What you do here? You press Ctrl and C so that you copy that because you need to save it. And you go on the file here in the AUX data and you create a file named Expressions. I have it already created for you. And what you do is you just go up here and you right click and paste it. And you have the information of the polygon. Okay, I have this done. No need to copy it again. Let's go back. And then you click OK. Once you save that, you do not need this geometry anymore. So you just click on it and you press delete and you delete it. Okay, now I can close all these view images, the view windows. And it is time now for us to go and start creating a chain of all the operators we want to use because all Sentinel-1 GRD data have some basic steps for pre-processing in order to be able to use them afterwards. First part we do. We click here on this icon, which is the Graph Builder, or we go to Tools, Graph Builder, it's exactly the same. And this window opens. Let me just expand it a bit. OK. First thing we do when we have a Graph Builder, we right click on the right operator and we delete it so that down here, as you can see, OK, let me put it this way. Up here, we have the read operator, and down here, you have the corresponding to that tab. In there, you insert all the parameters and everything needed for the processing. We will do it one by one. We will add all the parameters we need in order to complete the processing. But what we will not do now is we will not put any parameters down here on the tabs that will appear. This we will do it on the next step. I will explain you why. So, first thing we do, we need to add the apply orbit file operator. So we right click on the white area. You go to add, radar, apply orbit file. And then we select this arrow. We drag it towards the apply orbit file and we connect the operator down here you can see the corresponding tab. Why do we do that? This step is necessary because the orbit state vectors that are provided in the metadata of a SAR product are generally not that accurate. And they can be refined with the precise orbit files, which become available some days to maybe some weeks after the, gen the generation of the product. The orbit file now it provides accurate satellite position and velocity information. And based on this information, the orbit state vectors in the abstract metadata of the product are updated. Where is the abstract metadata? If you go here on the left, you see the metadata. Okay, next step we need to do. We need to add the operator for thermal noise removal. So let me add it and I will explain you what it does. We go to Add, Radar, Radiometric, Thermal Noise Removal. OK. So, this operator, why we use it? Because there is this thermal noise in the SAR imagery, which is the background energy that is generated by the receiver itself. What it does? It skews the radar reflectivity to towards higher values and actually, it hampers the precision of radar reflectivity estimates. 
So for this kind of products, in order to be able to use them, we need to remove, to remove this noise. Once this step is done, we need to calibrate the image. What is the calibration? Let me add the operator by going here. Right click, add radar, radiometric, and calibration. And we connect this as well. Okay. What is this? Why we need to calibrate the image? So, for this kind of data, the level 1 images we are using, they do not include radiometric corrections and there are some significant radiometric bias. This correction is necessary for the pixel values so that they can truly represent the radar backscatter of the reflecting surface and this way we can actually compare the different images acquired in different times. Then, then we want to apply a filter to this image so that we remove uh, another noise. Let me just right click and go to Add, Radar, Speckle Filtering, Speckle Filter. And we connect it to the calibration. So, what is the Speckle Filter? The speckle is caused by some random constructive and deconstructive interference of the defaced but coherent return waves that are scattered by the elementary scatterers within each resolution cell. So this reduction can be applied using this speckle filter and this is how we remove the noise of the speckles. Once we have complete all these steps, what we need to do is to terrain crank the data. What do I mean with the terrain correction? First, let me right click and go to Add, Radar, Geometric, Terrain Correction, Terrain Correction. I don't know if you remember, but we saw the images how they look like before that I opened them, and we noticed that they are actually upside down. Why is this happening? This is happening because the way the satellite is passing is always looking to the right. And the first thing it sees, this is the first thing that depicts here when we open it. So what we need to do in order to correct the data so that they don't look mirrored upside down, north to south, we need to apply the terrain correction. Also, right now, the data we have are in radar geometry and there are always some topographic variations of a scene and also there is the tilt of the satellite sensor and sometimes the distances can be distorted in these images. So in order to fix all these issues, we need to apply the terrain correction and basically translate the radar geometry into geographic coordinates. And having done that, what we would like to do afterwards, because what we care about is to see the coastlines, is we want to remove the sea from the image. We want only the land to remain. How we do that? We right click, we go to Add, Raster, Masks, Land Sea Mask, and in there we have the option to remove the sea from the image. Last step we do. Once we have done all these parts, we just want to save the product. We want it to, to be written. So we go to Add, Input, Output, Write, and we add again the operator we had before, so that this way we finalize our processing chain. The other question is why we do this chain and we do not do these steps one by one. Because if I take the, the first product, and I apply the orbit file separately, it will store an output. Then I take the, this output and I perform the th uh, thermal noise removal. It stores a, a second output. So if I do it one by one, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different outputs. And this takes space. 
This way, it will run all the processors and it will store only one final output. And we save actually both time and space. But as I said, we will not provide any parameters down here in these tabs. And this is uh, happening because we want to apply this sequence for all the seven images we downloaded. Once you create this graph, you can save it. You can go here, save. And for example, I save it here in our folder in the AUX data, and I have named it processing graph. And I click save. Having saved that, you just click this window, and then in order to apply this graph at once for all the seven different products, we need to go to Tools and click on Batch Processing. So here we have this window. Let me make it a bit bigger. Okay, first thing we do, we go down here and we deselect the option that says Keep Source Product Name, because if you accidentally store the outputs in the same directory where you had the original data, it will keep the same name and it will basically rewrite the original products you had. So just to stay on the safe side, deselect this option. And then we load the graph. We load the graph, which is here and is named processing graph. Okay. We see that up here, all these tabs have appeared now. Where are the data we want to process? They are here on the left, and we very easily add them here by clicking on Add Opened. And this is opening all the products that are here on the Product Explorer. Perfect, these are our products. So now it is time to go step by step, tab by tab, and set the parameters. First of all, we click on the subset. We go here in the geographic coordinates, and down here in this area, we will insert the polygon that we saved before. So if I go here to the expressions and I copy this part, Control and C, I go down here, I press Control and V to paste it, and then I click Update. Then I can also click here and zoom. Sometimes zoom is not working, so you can just do it with the mouse. You can zoom in and you will see that there is this yellow rectangle that has been created over the area of interest that we said before. And then we continue to the next step. We go to the Apply Orbit File. Over here, make sure that you select this option of Do not fail if new orbit file is not found, because as we said, it takes some time for the orbit files to become available, the updated ones. So just to, say, to stay safe, always select this option. If we go now back to the subset tab, now that we set this parameter in the orbit file, we can see that as source bands, we can see the amplitude, the intensity of both polarizations. As we said, now here you can see the whole product way better. On red, we have the original extent of the product, and here on yellow is the very small area that we plan to use. So this will save us a lot of processing time. Again, as mentioned before, we only need to work with the V8 bands. So here we select the amplitude V8, we press Ctrl, and we select the intensity V8 too. We proceed with the next ones. And here in the thermal noise removal, we want to process only the V8, so we select only this one. If you want to process both, you don't select anything or you select them both. Then we continue to the calibration. Again, you see now since in the previous step we selected only the V8s, in the next step it takes only the V8s now. And this is the important stuff we need to make sure is selected we need to have the output sigma naught band selected. This is what we need. This will be the result of the calibration. Afterwards, in order to remove, remember this noise of this texture of this white and black? 
we need to apply some filters. Again, this is our band that will be created from the calibration. And based on literature, from all these options, we should keep this default one, the Lee Sigma. Here there are some other filters. I, I will not go into details on what each filter uh, does exactly, so there are some slight differences. But based on literature for such cases, we know that the Lee Sigma filter with window size 7x7 7 7 works the best. There are more options. It has to do with what information you have and how advanced you are so that you select the appropriate filter and then change the rest parameters. For this exercise, we'll leave them as they are. Next, we go to the terrain correction. Again, in the source band, we have only the sigma naught V8. And here, in the digital elevation model, it's automatically the SRTM 3 seconds. We can go and select, for example, the SRTM 1 second. As you see also in the map projection here, we have automatically this option, which is the geographic latitude and longitude. This is amazing to keep it like that when we want to export the data afterwards for a visualization in Google Earth. But in this case, since I want to insert them in QGIS, I will change the, proje the projection and I will use the UTM WGS84 automatic. And then once I click OK, it automatically finds the UTM zone this area belongs. I will show you uh, in a bit later. In case you want to export anything in uh, Google Earth, we can reproject the data afterwards, only the final product. We can show that later. Once you have set this information, you go now to the land sea mask, make sure the source band is the V8s, and you select here the mask out the sea. This is all you need to do. And now you just go to write. And as you can see here, it is automatically keeping the original name of the product. It adds the subset in the beginning. And then at the end, it is adding these suffixes orb for apply orbit file, nr for thermal noise removal, cal for calibration, spk for speckle filter, tc for terrain correction, and for, last, uh, for land sea mask, it doesn't add anything, but that's not a problem. This is our final product. Now you only need to make sure that you have set the correct directory where you want to save the data. In this case, uh, I have saved it as COS02 coastal erosion in the processing folder that we mentioned before. Now that all parameters are set, you just click run and then it starts automatically to run that graph for each of the seven products separately. And once everything is done, these products appear here on the left in the product explorer window. I will not run it now, but I will load the data that I processed already for you. I can simply close these products. Actually, I will select them all and then right click and close seven products. Here we click no. And now I go here on the processing folder and I will load all the products that have been created from this processing chain. Again, I load them from the oldest to the most recent. First, 2015, then 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. Now that I have them all here, if I expand them, you see that we have much less folders than we had before. And if I expand the bands folder, we only have the sigma naught V8s. I just double click to visualize it. And I do the same for all of them because I will tell you why we need this step to be done. Okay, and this one, and that's it. As you can see, this area is way smaller than the one we had before. Again, if we go here to Windows, Tile Horizontally, we can see that based on the parameters we set, 
the same area has been subset. Okay, if you zoom in a bit more now, you will see that some areas are black, some are white, and in general they go in the gray scale. If we now go up here to the pixel info, and then we pass over some areas, we will see that whenever we move the mouse, on the left, on the pixel info, on the sigma not v8, here we're having a value. So here you see the different values. If we zoom in a bit more over the areas that belong to coast, and if we try to distinguish which area is land and which is water, we will find, if we move along, and also based on some literature, according to the values of the sigma naught, we will find that there is a limit, let's say, at around 0.02 value of intensity of the sigma naught, that anything that is higher than that is uh, corresponding to water, and anything less than that corresponds for sure to land. This threshold might change, so every time you need to check according to the area of your interest. In this case, we will keep the 0.02. For other cases, it might need to be 0.01 or uh, another number. So, we go to the Product Explorer. We close all these views. We do not need them now that we see how this pixel info works. Okay, and what we want to do is we want to mask out these values that are not useful for us. For example, let me do the first one. Let me open the sigma node of the product of 2015 and we will make a comparison. First, we right click on that and we go to band maths. This is a very useful tool. In the name of the band, we can name it, for example, mask. What you also need to do now is to deselect this option of virtual, because if you keep it like that, it will not store the data. It will just show you the result. So we deselect it because we want it to store the data. And we click on edit expression. And we write here an expression. And we basically say, if this sigma naught v8 has values higher than 0 0.02, then consider it as no data value. Else, consider it as the sigma naught we had in the beginning. And you click OK. And again, you click OK. And here we see that some pixels have been removed. Now, if I put these windows close the one to the other, you will see, like for example, we have the area in here. We used to have all these pixels on the left, the white pixels, that on the right they have been removed. This is why we say just be careful with the threshold because if you use a higher one, it will probably remove too much information that will be useful for you and you will lose the sense of reality. Now that you see that, we understand that this corresponds way better to reality than the original sigma naught without uh, having been masked. So very quickly now, let me close this one, I will do the same for all the other products. As you can see, once you create the mask, here on the left, under the bands, it appears. So we will do this for all the products by writing exactly the same expression every time. OK. And every time we do it, Let's go to window single. Every time we do that, the mask appears here on the view window. 
So I continue with the next product, mask, deselect this option, edit the expression, Know that if you do not do this step, you will actually have wrong results and you will not be able to very well distinguish where uh, the coastline is. And we continue with the other one. But always be careful in case you want to use a standard threshold, there is not an answer that there is one standard threshold. You always need to check what is happening in your area and then select the appropriate one. Okay. One more second. write the criteria, else this one, okay. And also note that every time that you run a band match, you can see down here on the right, once you write the expression, like here, if I just write the if, it says term expected. I insert the term, but it is missing something afterwards, so I continue with what I need to provide to it so that it understands. And once you continue writing, you will see that, for example, now that I have it complete, it says OK, no errors, and you click OK. Otherwise, it will not be working. And in case you're trying to find out why it is not working, just make sure that you correctly read down here on the right what the indication is. Let's do this for the final product too. Okay. And now that we have all the masks over here, we are done with the pre-processing and we are ready to export these parts as GeoTIFFs so that we import them in QGIS. How do we do that? The simplest way, for example, is let's go to the first one that corresponds to the 2015. If you just right-click on the one that is opened here, and you go Export View as Image, make sure that you select the full scene so that it takes the whole picture and then you go down here in the files of type and you select GeoTIFF, TIFF with geolocation. And then we need to give it a name. Uh, I gave it, for example, this one. I gave it 2015-0717 mask, underscore mask, and I did the same for the other products. And then you click save. Make sure you save it in the correct path that you wish every time. We repeat the same for the other six products as well, so that they are uh, ready to be inserted in QGIS. And this is the step that I told you that you might want to export this information and put them in a Google Earth. In order to do that, if you right click and go export view as Google Earth KMZ, you will get this error message saying product must be in geographic uh, latitude longitude projection which was the default one but remember we changed it to be able to use it in QGIS so you click OK and you go to raster geometric operations reprojection and basically what do we do in here we take the images one by one all the seven you see that the reprojected is added afterwards you make sure you have the correct directory down here and then you go to the processing parameters and you leave this geographic uh, lat loan as it is and you click run. Immediately this is reprojected, it appears here on the left in the product explorer and then once you have this, 
you just open it, you open the band, the mask band, you right click on that like this and you export it as Google Earth KMZ and you store it. Okay, I can now close Snap so that we pass to QJS. I minimize this window and I open here the QGIS. Okay, in order to make it a bit faster, I have already created um, a session in advance, but what you have to do in order to insert the data is go here to the processing and find these T files you have over here and just drag them and drop them here down on the left on the layers panel so that you load them. Uh, together with that, we will also use some auxiliary data. We will use some data of the coastline as it has been approved and uh, issued for Senegal coastlines. I will tell you uh, also in the tutorial on where you can find these SAPE files. So now, in order to make it a bit quick, uh, I will just open the session I had created before. So, here as you can see, I have loaded first uh, in view mode the 2015 mask, which is this one. What I will do is I will put some background so that we have a reference and we can understand. So we go to web, open layers plugin, Google Maps, Google Satellite. And this I will put it at the very end so that it is not over my layers. What we have done here? For each one of these masks, we have created a shape file so that we have the coastline corresponding to this one. So I will not play a lot with the zoom because uh, based on this Google Satellite background I have, it is not loading correctly all the time. But if I just deselect it and I zoom in, you will see here that the save file we have, it goes based on the boundaries that we have here from these pixels. Remember that if we had kept the data as we had them before, before we mask them, all this area would have been full of pixels and it would have been giving totally wrong results. If you want out of curiosity to export the unmasked GeoTIFF and put it here, you will see the differences on the coastline and the results. So how we create the coastline? Ideally, in order to do that, you need to have some validation with optical data, with Sentinel-2 or any other optical data you can have. In this case, we are processing only the, um, the radar data and afterwards we will insert them in Google Earth and we will see the comparisons over there. And also, as we can go only back to 2015 with this radar data, we will exploit Google Earth and we will see the images that have been captured even 10-15 years before today. So, how to create this coastline? You go up here on the layer, create layer, new shape file layer. In here, you write the file name, like I did here, I wrote coastline 2015. And then you click on these three dots and you browse it where you want to save it. In my case, I wanted to save it here in the AUX data folder that I have created in the Coast02 Coastal Erosion. And you click Save. You see that the file name appears up here together with the name of the product. You need then to set the geometry type. From all these four options, we want to select the line because we want to create a line. We do not change any of the other parameters and we just click OK. Once we click OK, it appears here on the left. Once it appears, you go like I did now and you click on it so that it is selected and it becomes blue. And then what you do is you go up here in this pencil, the toggle editing, you click on that 
and now this layer is editable. In order to create the line that should go across this boundary, which remember, based on the parameters we used in Snap, this is how we managed to distinguish, to distinguish the land from the sea and find this boundary. You go to this option, Add Line Feature, you click on that, and you see now that from the hand it becomes this cross with a circle around. So you then start, you zoom in of course way more, and you then start one by one, like you see here, and you go and you click following this information you have on your raster. Okay, uh, I will not do that. I will cancel this one because I have done it already. So once you finish and you have the coastline that you want, you go again up here in the toggle editing and you save the edits. A window will appear asking you if you want to save the edits. So we did exactly the same for all the others, uh, for all the other rasters we have. For 2016 too, we have the coastline and then we proceed to the 2017 and we have the coastline and this is how we have actually all of the years going to one by one and seeing where is this area that distinguishes the land from the sea based on the pre-processing we did in SNAP. Okay. Now what I will do to make it easier for, for you to see it is I will load the Google Satellite background but it's not working if I do not load a mask. So I load it, let me load the most recent, the 2021. And what we have now is I will load all the coastlines that we have for created for all these years which each one I set it to a different color and also, like if you zoom here, you will see the different lines, the coastlines. And you can see that some of the areas are not that accurate. That is happening because we're talking about uh, Sentinel-1 data, it's not optical data, and it is not an automatic process. There are some commercial software where they have some toolboxes available that you can uh, automatically retrieve this information but this is not available here in what we demonstrate now. The other thing that I want to add here is the coastline as it is provided from the experts. And this coastline has been created, if I'm not wrong, in around 2012. This is a bit older. So if you see, I have here the coast of all Senegal. And you see that there are some slight distortions uh, sometimes. It also takes a bit of time for the background image to load correctly, so we might see some differences. But what's, what is important for us is if we go here and we check this line that we have, the Senegal coastline, it more or less goes quite well with the lines that we have created, the coastlines of the different dams. What we notice here, which is not very clear over here, that's why we will move to Google Earth, is that some areas we have huge erosion, while in some others we have deposition. And these uh, beaches over here are sandy beaches. So we will see why in some areas we have deposition, while in some other we have erosion, as since the material is exactly the same. I showed you before how to export these uh, raster, these masks, for using them in Google Earth. But what we want to also export is also the coastlines we created. Here they are uh, as save files, and the save files they cannot be loaded in Google Earth. We need to transform each one of them into a KML file. So we go to the coastline 2015. We right click and we go export, save features as. And over here in the format on the top, 
it will be selected the Esri save file automatically. But you need to go and from all this menu, you need to select the KML, the Keyhole Markup Language. Again, you set up a file name, for example, as we have it, Coastline 2015. You go here and you select the path you want to export it here in the AUX data and you save it. You leave the rest information as they are and you click OK. And this is how you transform the save files into KML files to use them in Google Earth. So uh, I can close QJS now and I will open Google Earth. Okay, how do we open the Google Earth in this Roos virtual machine? We go here in the terminal and we write google-earth-pro and then we click enter and it opens the Google Earth. In this case, uh, I will not do it this way. I have already saved a session with all the information we want in Google Earth. So I will close this one and the terminal and I will go in the AUX data folder that I have stored this information as KMZ. I have named it Senegal KMZ. I just double click on that and it opens on Google Earth. What information I have in here? I have information of all the rasters, as we did in QJS, and I have all the coastlines. So, here on the left, let's see the options we have. We have enabled the coastline of 2021 and also the mask of 2021. Now, if we zoom in, we can see that our results correspond quite well to reality. We face some uh, small errors, then we see some areas that have different results. But don't worry, we will go one by one to them and we will see some parts that I would like you to know after you leave this webinar. So why we chose this area? This area is having a different reaction to the waves from area to area. We can go and find another area that we see significant changes if we go along this one. For example, over here. What do we have here? Let's go to the today. So this is the image we have today. This area is important, as you see, there are quite some houses, a lot of businesses, and this is not the way it actually looks uh, very natural. Let us go a bit on the past. And let's start with what was happening in 2003, which is the oldest one we can go. Okay, not very visible. 2003. Here you see that we see these structures, this one, this one over here, let me deselect a bit this mask. Okay, here we have this small area, we can call it a mini port, a small port. And let's see how this area is behaving as the time is passing. In 2003, we see that we start to have some, um, some uh, sand here on this area on the beach. But in 2009, you can see that we have way more beach. And this is happening because these man-made constructions are responsible for blocking the sediments so that they do not move. And this way, the sediments stay here and they create this bit. Also, this port, you see, it starts to become operational. If we continue after 2009 and we go to most recent years, we see that the deposition continues but you can see that but you can see that it depends also on the weather conditions that you have every time that sometimes we are losing a bit of sediment and sometimes we have some more that is being added so as the year pass we are in 2012 now you see that also in this area there is a lot of sediment that starts to remain here too continuing even more, you see how this changes from time to time, and we see the evolution. 
And if you want, you can take uh, older data, radar data, that are older than Sentinel-1, and you can try to make this process. Yes, as you see, the more we come closer to today, the more sentiments we have on this area deposited. You also see that for some years we have more than one image acquired. So if you want to process data, you can easily take more than one image per year or even more than one per month. And as we are reaching close to today, you see that this situation is now stable and it is safe for the area. You see how these sediments are being deposited here and this coast is actually expanding. Okay, and we are almost close to the today. You see that now we have even more sand. If we now move to another area to use as an example, let me zoom out a bit. Okay, let's travel a bit along the beach. Not this one. If we go here, for example, you see this part. We see how this area was, and as we move closer to the today, we will see that at some point in the past, the erosion was so much that there were several and major issues in the area. So after we continue coming closer to today, you see that some action has been taken, like here again, we have these man-made constructions. And as we go closer to today, we see that the authorities are continuing to expand this infrastructure so that we have the result we want and we start again to create or even just maintain the coastline we had. And here you see that this has been expanded because it was necessary to be done like that. And after this has been created, you see in here how much sediment can be accumulated. Also, what is the advantage of that? You can see that in here we have some boats, some small boats. This makes the conditions in there, even if it's uh, wavy, so that some boats can remain in the area and be safe and secure. And this keeps expanding, as you can see. And the more this uh, infrastructure are being created, the more we have sediments being deposited on the beach. As you can see, sometimes we're uh, having some issues with this infrastructure. Either they are covered by water, it also has to do with the timing the image was taken, or they are destroyed. And when we face such issues, you see that again here all sediment is left. And we are in 2017, where things seem to work quite well. And we continue closer to today, so that we see how this area has evolved. You see that in the past, in here, it used to have way more sediments. But the last three years, three, four years, we're having issues and we do not have this coast that we had before. So this is an area that keeps changing all the time. As I don't want to waste a lot of your time, I will just uh, use a last example. Let me zoom out. Okay, so I'm just moving a bit uh, southern to show you this example over here. Here we have this area where we basically see that the shoreline should be outside here. But why is the shoreline that close to the buildings and we do not have it anymore? And you can see how close it is to the buildings and how much this erosion here is affecting the locals. Let us go a bit in the past. So, 
if we click here in the past and we go over here for example in 2003 we can see that the area used to have way more um, coast let's move closer to today 2009 not that much of a difference and we continue 2010 we keep continuing 2011 2011 again 12 we see that we start losing a lot of coast in the last 10 years yes and we continue 13 14 and we start seeing the problem which is quite important in the area and we continue 15 almost there what do we start to see here here on this area we start to see these two infrastructures let's keep that in mind and let's continue moving through the years 16 17 still 17 we move to 18 we see that the issue with the erosion is persistent and we continue we are only to 2018 now 19 And what do we see now in 2019? Okay, we see this infrastructure. So in 2019, after August, these areas, these barriers have been planted in the sea. What will be the result of these? Let's continue to see. A bit later, only one month later, we see that the situation is not that bad anymore. But if we continue second month afterwards, and then we keep continuing three months later, we see that some coast starts to be created over here. And if we continue more, this happened last year, as you can see, you will see the evolution and as we go closer to today we are June 2020 and we continue what do we have down here? let's see you see the difference? here over this region it doesn't really have good results but over here in this region it has amazing results let me just go a bit back. You see? July 2020. This is the coast. Here you see these barriers and how they actually break the waves. And the result is, if we move to the next image, three months later, four months later, you see how well this construction is working over here. So we're having this beach that is being created, the sediments are being deposited and we stop having the major erosion problem. Let's see, this is one year past time from now. If we continue, we see that this area keeps uh, keeping more and more sand on the beach. What we also see now is that, is that after one year, also this part it starts to finally work and this whole area is now prevented from erosion 
And as we go more closer to today, you see that this is working that well. So this uh, sand has been accumulated and it's reaching this construction. Also, why is that important? Because as you can see, if we zoom in in that, it's already people exploiting this area, which is for touristic purposes. And this is how we can prove that, yes, coastal erosion is happening. Yes, there are areas that they are not eroding, but we have a sediments deposition. And here are the ways that the local authorities can actually uh, use the technology, use the knowledge we have, and prevent the areas from erosion. You can navigate for as long as you want. Um, I think I will stop showing you now how this area looks like. And I will close Google Earth. And I will just need one minute in the presentation before we continue. Let me tell you again that you can repeat this exercise by your own if you want to practice or adapt the methodology to your own application. In order to repeat the exercise, go to the RUS portal, register and apply for a virtual machine. During that process, you just need to specify the training code COS02 when needed. You will receive the training kit that contains the PDF of the step-by-step -step guide and the auxiliary data. Also, if you simply want to download the PDF of the tutorial, you can go to the RUS portal and under the RUS library menu, click on Train with RUS, select the Ocean Coasts tab, and you will find the COS02 tutorial uploaded. Just to remind you that all these auxiliary data I mentioned with the coastlines, the KMLs, and everything included in there, expressions and the rest, they are available once you request a RUS virtual machine. So, um, this was all from my side. Here you can see where you can reach us for any questions you may have. And I would like to thank you very much for joining.